All right, all right, all right. It's Friday. Excitement time again. Indeed. Welcome to Geopolitics in Conflict Live. Live. So good to see you guys, uh, whatever part of the world you're in. We are so excited to be here. And as I always say, you know, it was just last Friday, Ross. <laughs> and here it is. That's how fast time goes. So we just wonder, you know, this life is going by quickly. So, fast. so make the best out of it and be happy and be positive. <laughs> so, all right. Let's, uh, well, let's thank our subscribers. So, as, as our joke is continuing, we're inching closer and closer to 70 million, million subscribers. subscribers. <laughs> we get in there. We get in there. So, uh, we want to really, on a serious note, guys, we want to thank you for your continued support because it means a lot to us. And without you, we couldn't do it. So, uh, we also want to thank our Patreon members who keep, uh, their continued support means a lot to us. But also for our new members on the geopolitics, geopolitical, uh, geopolitics, that geopolitics in conflict dot com membership. So please make sure you you check out that membership because of what we offer in it. So we offer live Q and A's on those, and those are on a because we can answer all the questions, guys. You know, we receive about a, a thousand questions on the on 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 the set per se, and and. As you know, reality suggests we won't be able to answer all this. So we also offer uh, uh, live presentations on some hot topics. And the reason why I personally like that, because we can talk freely. You all know, we don't need to beat the dead horse here. You all know how censorship, how real it is. Our membership provides us that platform where we can do that freely. And we have a lot to share. You know, unfortunately, we can share some stuff on this platform as you know so so make sure to check out that membership and uh we look forward i'm also on uh uh what was the other one elizabeth that i uh the other platform we have that rumble i go and odyssey. rumble and odyssey and, and TikTok, uh instagram and twitter and twitter and one more there is another one facebook no no <laughs> <laughs> hold on i'm gonna get locals. it locals we're on locals uh, is that right? there is another one what? yes it is and the other one is Discord. Oh, we, oh yeah. For our members, members. Yeah, for members yeah. only, of course. But that's why uh, this this uh, uh, perks that comes with this membership, guys. It's being on a Discord. It's a community on its own. I get on it. I answer questions there. I have some uh, very interesting conversations with some members there. So so just check it out, guys. And and hopefully you will you will uh, uh, join that membership and, and and see what's in it for it. So. All right, let's let's chat about you know, what's every, going on around the world. Every week when we go through the list of the hottest topics, uh -huh. I'm impressed with the list gets longer and longer. <laughs> Let me start with this one. Washington issued a statement via Twitter confirming its observation of Article 41 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Well, indeed, this came up about when uh, when uh, uh, President of Turkey, Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, issued that threat of expelling of uh, uh, the explosion of 10 ambassadors including the united states so what the us did right away because that will be very very bad uh, diplomatically uh, uh, what the united states did issued the twitter right away uh, citing article 41 and i'm going to share it with you what's in article 41 uh, 41 of the geneva of the of the uh, Vienna Convention, Geneva Convention regarding diplomatic relations. It states, and I quote, without prejudice to their privilege and immunities, it is the duty of all persons enjoying such privilege and immunities to respect the laws and regulations of the receiving state. They also have the duty to not interfere in the internal affairs of that state. End of quote. So that just tells you right there, the U.S. realized it was the wrong move to state whatever they state about that guy, uh, Osman Kavala, whatever. Yeah. And they realized how wrong they were. So. Bill Gates had a very awkward interview. Uh, <laughs> and you have to ask, it was so awkward, you have to ask, What's he hiding here? Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw that, or it's it's on the on the, on YouTube. So it was very awkward. Even Bill Gates, uh, you know, the guy is a little bit out of it. You know, 
Uh, I'm sure you've heard about when he was kicked out of India for what he was doing for the polio, I think. Yeah. Some, some stuff like that with, with children. And children end up being born deformed in India. Was doing the same in Africa. He was kicked out of Africa. And now here in the U.S., he's pushing too much for this GMO stuff. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's one of the uh, large uh, farmland owners. That makes you just wonder what he's thinking. So makes you really curious yeah. as to what's going on here. So, but this one, when he was asked about Epstein, and you could just see he's sitting and and doing this. Usually, those are uh, behaviorists will know exactly what does it mean. You have something that you are hiding, not willing to talk about. So one of the, one of the things we're considering is doing because my background is linguistics. Yeah, is doing a linguistic analysis of that interview. Oh, we're our viewers, we're, we're considering. It. I'm going to be doing it with Elizabeth. Yeah, because that's so, not my area. Yeah, yeah, that is. I have significant background in yeah. in this kind of analysis. That would be great if you guys can do. It. Our viewers would benefit from something like that. Yeah. Meeting of the G20 in Rome. Same as always. More talks and no action. I know that's always the norm. Yeah, there is a meeting of G20 tomorrow. I am curious to know. Uh, some of them, some of the attendees, by the way, not going to be uh, faced to uh, all of them there. Some of them will be online, uh, but the majority will be there physically. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh u.s president is already in rome met with the pope for over one hour and a half makes you just wonder and by the way with all the respect to the catholics and all that uh, the vatican has its own dark side uh, don't even get me on that <laughs> so that's a conversation for a different time so that's what they are in rome uh for uh, preparing for this but it's gonna be just another just window dressing shall we say smoke on the screen yeah uh, there's no you know they talk too much but there's no action that's basically what i want to do there's a meeting in scotland about climate change and there's a big question about scotland and barbados and dumping oh, the queen as head of state oh could it be that scotland maybe should uh, seek its own independence from uk Obviously. there certainly has been a lot of conversation i know for a long time I about it. and maybe it's about time you know, Scotland can be independent on its own. They don't need Britain or the blessing of Britain. So, but anyway, the meeting in Glasgow, which will be about the environment, uh, of course, Guterres, the uh, uh, UN Secretary uh, General, will be addressing that. But I find it very ironic how the UN is advocating for climate change. And you remember that Twitter that was circling around? You mean about the diesels? <laughs> about the diesels, yeah. So, I mean, it just, you know, we'll say it straightforward. It's hot air, no more, no less. They all talk about this climate change. As a matter of fact, the, the consumption of coal here in the U.S. is increasing. Consumption of coal is important in China. Consumption of coal is important in India. Australia is producing more. As a matter of fact, Morrison came up, the prime of, of Australia, and said, we're going to meet zero emission by 2060. That's nonsense for what he's coming with. Australia depends greatly on production of coal. That's just plain lie. So, and that's what this environment is all. So it's just hot air, no more, no less. You don't mean he lied again. Oh, well, yeah, no, he let's did. Not go there. Yeah, let's not did. go there. <laughs> the U.S. intelligence community warned the U.S. will end its influence if it does not protect these five technologies. Yeah, those are has to do with uh, the idea of, uh, and I think we did mention this one yesterday. Uh, this one has to do with uh, artificial intelligence, quantitative statistics, yeah. uh, biological sciences, semiconductors, and autonomous systems. So, well, we'll be lucky enough next week to have one of our guests Oh, oh, who happens to know a whole lot about quantum computing? Yeah, he yeah. was great there. So, you guys, we're gonna have the guest, and uh, he's gonna be here next week. We're just confirming another remarkably yeah, yeah. important, so don't miss that influential up. guest. Yeah, so stay tuned for that one, guys. China developed a new quantum computer, it's called the Qin Chuang. The Qi Chuang. I have no 2. idea. How to Thank, Thank you. you. Thank my, you. My, my Mandarin <laughs> teacher would be proud of me. I did that one correct. Well, indeed, this and is. Guess, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead, Russ. Well, our guest is really a, a, an expert in this area, so we had to get a real lowdown on what's going on with this. You're absolutely correct, and this is why we're not going to say much because I do not know much, and I tend to speak my mouth because this is what we stand for: is the truth. You know, we're not going to be pretending to know everything. We don't know everything, but at the same time, because that gives me the opportunity, by the way, just to respond to some of comments we get. 
about the video we did regarding China. And some of them didn't like that one. Well, guess what? You know, this is what we stand for. It's the truth. You don't like it because it didn't fit your thinking? I mean, come on. Let's be realistic here, guys, because that's what you will expect from us. The truth, because that's what we stand for. And sometimes it's going to happen. You might not like what we say. And we greatly respect your opinion. But what bothered me the most was some comments that have no place into that. Well, you guys are way out of line. You guys don't know what you're talking about. No need for those kind of comments because that's condescending. No need for that. So, But we respect opinions no matter what. So we want you to know that. France and Great Britain. A history of crisis and water warfare. Oh, yeah, because France now is thinking of imposing sanctions <laughs> on the on Britain. <laughs> this one is tight. But this is more than just a, uh, what is at issue is has to do with some fishing rights. You know, what France ended up doing is they, uh, they held a, 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 boating, a boat, a fishing boat, whatever, from Britain uh, near the French waters. So, But <laughs> France is not about this. It has to do with other issues. But if you look at history, if you go back into history and see how France and England used to be. Oh, they have a long history. <laughs> yeah, this is no different than what it was. So that's basically what was the what was that issue. But it ties to other uh, global dynamics that's taking place, including the AUKUS, the subs that Australia ditched uh, France. Oh, with. so that's basically what it was all about. Okay, okay David, you ready for this one? I am. <laughs> 18 countries, including America, Britain, and France, condemn Moscow's repression of, in the in, of independent media. What, do you think hypocrisy plays here with Snowden <laughs> and Julian Assange? Yeah. So let's. Oh let's, my God. You know, where's the, the the double standards for all this? You know, this is what again. You know, we're gonna say it the way it is. You know, how can Germany be calling for this? How can France be calling for this? How can the United States be calling for this? How can UK be calling for this? What they are doing. To you take the example of Assange, and we're not defending Assange here. It's just right. the idea of you know you gotta be fair. You gotta be sort of you can't be pretending to be the defender of freedoms and all that. And on you're doing the opposite. That just hypocrisy, plain and simple. So I was surprised when I read the article about those ten countries uh, telling Russia that's the rights and uh, journalists and all that. So, well, look what you are doing. You know that just Hypocrisy, basically. That's all it is. Shall we go to the topic? Of the yes, topic? yes, because we want our viewers to uh, send us their questions because I found their questions a learning uh, uh, platform, believe it or not. I learn a lot from my our, our viewers' questions beside what we... And sometimes they give us rem remarkable information that we don't otherwise have. Exactly. So, so, and as always, guys, just remember to put a question there. So when Elizabeth pulls that, she knows it's a question, not a statement. And, and, and we'll read the question and answer, uh, answer it to the best of our knowledge. So, you yeah, know, let's, let's, let's talk about this one, Ross. You know, this is not an exaggeration because you see the headlines and you see crisis, crisis, crisis. Uh -huh. And it's not. However, what we're talking about today is a global energy crisis and what's behind it. And from what we can tell, this really is bordering on a global energy crisis. Well, exactly, because this is not limited just... I mean, have you ever seen uh, gas prices here in in, uh, in in Texas above $3? i never seen it. I, I could, don't remember seeing it, but I remember two years ago filling up for $1.64 a gallon. Yeah. I have pictures of it. I said, I'll never see this again. I didn't, I didn't realize it was going to go this high. Yeah, well, it's, it's also we have to understand that the big picture, because here is one thing that, guys, uh, I read enough personally, and I speak for myself, I read enough about it, is the understanding of how uh, geopolitics can impact oil prices and vice versa. And this right. is where that link between economics and geopolitics plays in. A lot of people do not think, how can geopolitics impact the oil prices? Well, it does. Because all you need to have, for example, all you need to have is a tension in some country that is an oil producing country. Right. And all of a sudden, you're seeing a spike in oil prices. We, we could all see it when there were any time a, a, a conflict erupts in the Middle East, how oil prices all of a sudden goes up. They're up. So, yeah. And this one here is tied to the consumption around the world. This is not just one country. You know, I take, for example, uh, and I take issue with Europe, for example, blaming China 
for the natural gas spike in prices. Well, wait a minute. What are you blaming China for? Yes, China needs a lot of lot of uh, uh, coal, for example. Right. Because that's how they feel. With the shortage in electricity they have. Because China did have or did still does have an issue of electricity shortages. But they are managing it to the best of their abilities, how whatever works for them. But for Europe to be blaming China, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The problem is it's on you, Europe, right. that they didn't replenish their stock. Right. So, the, the demand was down during the pandemic. Exactly. And they didn't replenish stock. And now that the economy is recovering, yeah. not, they don't have enough. And this is one thing like in China. And why we say in China? Because I read about it. When China recovered from this pandemic, their economy started to take off again. Yeah. Well, what comes with that? Consumption of yeah. energy. That's just common sense, you know. What it turns out to be is that in the case of Europe, you know, because they didn't replenish their, their supply, they end up where well, prices went up. Now they want to talk to Russia about uh, gas, for example, mm -hmm. and Russia said, sure, except we'd like to have a long-term contract. How it's reasonable fair. is that? It's fair. So for us in the United States, is we cut production. <laughs> but of course, because of the lockdowns, because the restrictions, because, you know, we got issues here in this country that are far beyond, which we can't talk about on this platform. We'll be happy. We're going to talk about those ones on the membership. That's where we, we talk about this. But just to bring it back to the energy, here in the U.S., we cut production, you know. And this is why uh, two days ago, <clears throat> actually three days ago, uh, the Secretary General of the U.N., you know what he said about Texas? He said, well, Texas needs to reconsider about renewable energy and so forth. <laughs> and the <laughs> governor sent him a text. You know what he says? Go pack sand. <laughs> yeah, because who, who the heck are you to be telling us what to do when it comes down to the energy? We all know Texas when it comes down to production. But here is where I see the big problem a lot. We have enough energy here. I've, I've always said this. We have enough energy. Yes, our oil is not that kind of top quality. It needs a lot of refinery. Okay? Well, why don't you, the government, the federal government, that is, why don't you build brand new refineries? Yep. Okay? Uh, some would say, what well, the cost of it? Okay, how much will it cost? It shouldn't exceed more than $100 billion. You know, you take the $100 billion out of the defense budget. Right. You know, and you build brand new refineries. And the oil we produce here can be refined. And we can distribute it across the country. Right. So this way we don't have to be depending on the Saudis because that's exactly what happened. And it happened a couple of years ago when uh, authorities asked the Saudis to update or upgrade the refineries in Houston. Right. Guess what the Saudis did? I know what they yeah. did. They said no. No. And they went ahead and built brand new refineries in China <laughs> at about $10 billion a cost. So... You know, they are free country. They can do whatever. It's a sovereign state. They can do whatever. But at the same time, knowing what I know personally about the lobbyists in Washington that works on behalf of the Saudis, you know, to keep the U.S. dependent on Saudi Arabia's energy. That is the one reality most Americans have no clue about. Look no further than what happened with 9-11, you know. Oh, my we, God. Was there any investigation? It was swept under the rug because Congress... That's what they did. And shame on Congress because the lives of the Americans, they were lost, 3,000 innocent people. doesn't matter whether you like Americans or not. That's beside the point. But they, they deserve justice. And when the investigation was about to be launched, it was swept under the rug. Right in front of American eyes, double standards. So, and, and this is what I see. We do have enough energy here. So it's just a matter of how we are managing our finances. And the government has no interest whatsoever us in improving the, the living conditions of Americans. You know, it's so shocking. You know, you compare this to China, where they at least make open statements about we want to we want to improve the quality of lives for the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. And there's some evidence that they're actually doing that. And they talk about it constantly. But the United States, you don't even hear about nah, it. Nah, no, nah, no, because it's hypocrisy here in this how politics is running here. So, so just to tie it to the energy aspects of it, you know, and you think about it, you know, if we have a refineries brand, we can refine our own oil. Right. I mean, we know the current administration went ahead and shut down the gas pipeline from uh, the uh, that comes from Tarzan in, in Canada all the way. In. Yeah. You know, all pure politics. Yeah. 
I understand. I truly understand. That also has to do with the supply and demand. That's common sense. When you have more supplies in the market, prices goes down. When you have less, of course, prices going to go up. But at the same time, some countries, some regions of the world were recuperating from the pandemic per se. Their economy started to take off somehow. You know, the demand for energy was common sense. Right. You know? And here is where OPEC is playing politics with, with the energy. Because the U.S. administration asked OPEC three times to increase production so the prices can come down. And they said... Did they said no. They didn't even respond. Oh, oh, based oh. on what I read. Okay. Based on what I read. They didn't even respond. So now they're saying, no, 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 no. We, we're going to see some increase, but increase of about 0.15, 0.15 million barrel per day, which is nothing in comparison. Well, I understand. What is it? The, the need is five and a half barrels, million barrels per day, greater demand. It's a, well, usually, usually for OPEC, you know, mm -hmm. Saudis by themselves, they can add 10 million barrels if they want to. That's how much oil they have. But at the same time, this is where you see the role of energy as a political tool. Yes. And that's why I said earlier at the beginning, guys, you know, energy can influence uh, geopolitics and vice versa. So you'll, you, you, you remember what Dr. Parsi said about how our presence in the Middle East with the Saudis and all that stuff. <laughs> That, that's usually how the dynamics are working. So, But when it comes down to energy, because this a whole notion of the United States providing security umbrella to the Saudis was for nothing, for one particular item. And that item is? Oil. Oil. That's what do you oil. know? What Shocking. do you know? Yeah, energy. you're right. Oil. That's that's a, well because without the without the U.S. protection, Saudis will be will be run out. By, <laughs> so, but that's that's a separate conversation altogether. So the idea of understanding whether and some research has uh, recent ones, as a matter of fact, uh, did find that for example, the consumption uh, in in China is going to keep going, the consumption of both oil and coal. Right. You know, and that's why China, for example, went ahead and. We all know the tensions uh, between economic tensions. That is not diplomatic, but economic tensions between China and Australia. Uh, China went ahead and started importing coal from, from uh, Indonesia. You know, complicating that was the flooding in China shut down any number of coal mines. And so the real shortage is occurring. Exactly. All this at the same time. Exactly. But the key to me, the key that I see how those dynamics of oil prices is, is the OPEC. Yeah. Mind you that. Next week, on November 4th, it will be the meeting of OPEC. I am very curious. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to go play golf that day, Russ, because I'm <laughs> okay. going to be watching our prices. <laughs> Just because I'm interested in knowing that. Because I understand the impact of something like that. Because here is the thing. What, what, what the, at least for us in America, I can't speak for other countries, but here is the thing for us in the United States. What the administration is not saying to the American people is that, if oil prices hit $100 a barrel, that's going to add to the recession. That's going to add to more problems, economic problems, that is, we already have. You think an increased inflation? Ooh. Oh. Actually, they're predicting, the government, the government stated, and I read one uh, from Bloomberg, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, that's where I saw it. Uh, that the inflation is going to be for about 3% for the next five years, which you and I know it's a lie. It's a it is a lie. lie. It is a lie. The government is lying to the American people because we are noticing more and more American families are getting poorer. More and more people have been dismissed from their jobs. More and more economic prosperity in the American lifestyle is not the way it used to be anymore. You know, I, I mentioned in one of our other shows, I was talking to a food producer, an executive, uh -huh. and he said already in 2021, food prices are up 8%. Wow. And I, when I go to the store, I believe it. Well, yeah, because that's usually how uh, uh, this, this idea of oil prices, you know, the, the government is not coming forward as saying exactly where things are. You know, why are you lying to American people about 3% inflation when, you know, an average Joe, an average Jane, who might not be an economist, can see it when he or she goes to the grocery store. The items you used to buy at a dollar now cost a dollar eighty-five to almost two dollars. And you know, with some with more than half the population living paycheck to paycheck, they see it. 
They don't need the government to tell them it's 3%. They can see that they just can't buy what they could buy even last year. Yeah, it, it, it's a sort of, you know, let's let just say it's straightforward. I hope there are a lot of Americans watching this. You know, this is more will be for the domestic uh, uh, audience here than overseas, whatever. But of course, uh, we welcome our viewers from around the world. But for American consumers, they need to know the truth of what's going on in this country, economically speaking, because things do not look good moving forward. Usually I'm, I'm personally, and I speak for myself, I'm an optimistic guy. I think positive about things, but I can't sugarcoat it. When the government comes out and says, well, it's only 3% inflation for the next five years, that is a big lie because it is a lie. It's going to be far worse than that. If I may do a, a quick statistic sure. about, about Germany. Yeah. Because it isn't just going to hit the United States. When you We expect a cold winter in Europe. Because it's cold every winter. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> and what might have been a, a fuel bill for to heat your home mm -hmm. was 100 euros a month. The prediction is it's going to be. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, she confirms your she confirms she confirms that's your right. assertion. So. It's going to be 400 euros to heat your home this winter. Mm -hmm. You talk about a significant increase. Yeah. And that, what does it mean? That when you break that down to that 400 is going to end up now being taken away from the food you buy, right? You know, the health care you receive for your family, your environment where you live, your mortgage payments, right? Your insurance and so forth. You know, it's just your standard of living is going to start going down. This is in Europe. We have the same here, even worse here, right? Because people have been in this country, which is something has not been reported aggressively enough. And we will address those kind of social issues. People have been living in the United States from paycheck to paycheck. You know, one stats that I read, there was an average Joe has only about three to four hundred dollars in savings. That's it. Yeah. I mean, it's just the reality for where things are. And today, this morning, on my way here, you know, I just read, find out, listen to it. But I did check it out. Uh, an article came up on Wall Street about how the administration is going to be now handing out thanks to illegal immigrants. I mean, come on. We understand America is a country of immigration. You know. Correct. Who is American here? I don't know. Nobody. <laughs> yeah. Nobody. Everybody came from, came from somewhere. The land belonged to the Indians. But that's a separate conversation altogether. But the question that all of a sudden you are allocating almost about a million dollars a family that you can ever give to a legal. When you're allocating that money from the welfare of the American people, the ones that are paying taxes. Right. And I kind of find that it's not right. But you got Americans who are sleeping, <laughs> have no clue about what's going on in, 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 in the country because they are so glued to the idiot box, you know, reclining on their chair, s s snacking on chips or whatever that is, rather than thinking about the hard issues that here. Once they start hitting their pockets, they're going to pay attention, but it might be too late by then. You know, and second, why the government will go about giving money to illegals for why? Wait a minute. Why? That money doesn't belong to you. That money belongs to the taxpayers. And it is our right to understand why. Right. We have a right to know where our money is spent on. But when you got a society that is ill-informed completely, you know, it got like information being shoved down its throat lies from the government what you get because they are not intellectually challenged elizabeth and i are going to do a, a show sometime in the near future about education and how americans and maybe even world citizens are educated to not think but to be cogs in a machine that We're would planning, be great elizabeth and i are planning that show right now we want to see what's the causation of this how come people aren't in the streets saying you are not representing us. They can't tell when the government's lying to them. That is great. Yeah, because even education, which I won't even get into that. I, I'm, I'm a professor. I teach. You know, <laughs> you know don't get, don't even get me started on that because uh, right. I see what's in the classrooms and where the education system in America is going. You know, all those high-profile Harvard and Stanford and Columbia and all that stuff. You know, they got some dark, dark history behind it that most Americans have no clue 
what's taking place. But that's a, a conversation for another day. So just right. to get back to our oil issue here and understanding where where this is going, where the trend is going. Well, personally, and I speak for myself here, uh, I just do not see the prices coming down anytime soon. I wish I could have said it differently, but I can't sugarcoat it, guys. You, you, you know where I stand on, on, on issues. You know, but The reason why I don't see, uh, why I see it that way, not only has to do with the supply and demand, it's because also uh, OPEC, I think we did, that's why I'm curious to watch that the outcome of that meeting. Remember, they do have a, a closed session, usually in OPEC, which, you know, media does not. Where the real work goes on, that's the like real negotiation. Yeah, that's like what happened today between the Pope and the President of the United States. The the one hour and a half meeting was closed in closed. Nobody were there. So, so make sure you just wonder. So for the OPEC aspects of it, I'll be curious to see because you know will OPEC agree to increase production? We're talking about a few millions of barrels a day to lower the prices, and 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 I don't see how they're gonna do it given. The last two years, a global economy was hit hard, but it was hit hard because of an agenda. Right. Or was it hit hard because of mismanagement? Or was it hit hard because of this is where so-called global elites want the global economy to go? So one thing you can always do, and as I always say, you know, control the finances, control the economy. You got everybody going whatever direction you want. Exactly. This is the sad reality. So, so to break it down to our level, consumers, average Joe, average Jane, because we that's who we are. We are not a uh, this millionaire, whatever. We're just average people like you. Uh, the idea of oil prices, I, I just don't see it going down quickly enough. It might drop by because you look at the average now in the U.S. It's about three dollars and thirty cents. For us in the state of Texas, it goes between 2.99 to 3.3, you know. Uh, but here's the thing, and this is why the governor of this state uh, fired back at the UN Secretary General by saying, you know, go back sand, <laughs> because you, you have no idea about how Texas operates when it comes down to the energy. But I still, I am thinking about the solution for it from a much bigger uh, uh, perspective, which is how about if you allocate funding and build brand new refineries. That creates a job, of right. course, and that reduces our dependency on the Saudis or any other country that we get oil from. You know? Because this is, but at the same time, lobbyists won't allow it. Because when you think about it, Ross, it's just the simple idea of why don't we have, for example, here in the United States, why do we don't have speed train like China or Europe? <sighs> we don't have enough money? You don't mean that our Congress might be for sale. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Those, 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 those knuckleheads in Congress, you know, I, I kind of, I, I know not everybody's bad. I understand that. But at the same time, I am speaking reality here as far as the welfare of, you know, you build something like that that can connect to the East to the West. What it's going to do to people's lives, the economy, you know, that yeah. makes you wonder why other, why other countries are, you know so advanced into this stuff you know what makes it different why why can we go and ask them sit down and have a conversation can you explain to us the process by which you accomplish this or that why not cooperate you know the speed trains in germany were phenomenal i mean and their 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 whole construction is we're going to make we're going to connect all sorts of places so that you can live far away and in half an hour get there yeah Come on. Well, if you're going to go 300 miles an hour, yeah, yeah. you can. So, and this is, so to me, the, the solution to this is build the real oil refineries here uh, in state of Texas because we are a big state. We got an open space, build one, and which we, not only us, you know, the here in state of Texas, but the whole country can benefit from. Absolutely it. So right. Distribute oil all over the country. And the funding is there. Take some money out of the defense because enough with these wars and conflicts and weapons and all that. And allocated for that to build a refinery shouldn't cost you more than ten billion dollars. You know, how about if you take a hundred billion dollars out of the and budget? build ten of them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what it's going to do to the energy here? I mean, I know some say, well, easier said than that. No, 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 no. It has to do with the political will. If you have determination to make it happen, you make it happen. Right. You know, this is the difference between talking and acting. 
you know i always learned in my life you know to differentiate between a talker and a doer right you know and if i find somebody is a talker i kind of say thank you very much it's been nice meeting you we're done so in terms of energy what we have is there's no political resolve to make the right things happen for the united states because members of congress are in the pockets of lobbyists exactly that's what most americans do not understand so average joe average jane when he or she goes to fill up the tank of his or her car you know they, he or she couldn't think in terms of what could it be influencing this all i know is that the government raised the price for it. and now you're talking about the government thinking in terms of allocating taxes on the on the on on gasoline and all that stuff you know, because they want to go with the uh, infrastructure bill an infrastructure bill that has nothing to do with infrastructure <laughs> you know I, I looked at the bill that there is now in congress and what's in it you know allocation for 350 billion dollars for some environment whatever that is what this has to do with the infrastructure right you know typical pork barrel legislation yeah you know and that's where the sad part of it so so just to Think about it from the global aspects and we'll open up for questions. Yeah. So this way we don't want to be talking too much. <laughs> we, we've got a lot of energy for this yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, because I get I get fired up on this stuff because it really, it really pains me to see the ignorance of how many of us in America have no clue what the government is doing because we don't care to educate ourselves. No. Uh, the oil prices on the global market, you know, I just don't see OPEC agreeing to increase production unless unless there is an arrangement between non-OPEC members. This oh, is why yeah. Russia, for oh, example, yeah. didn't want. You know. But also, can you imagine if you didn't have sanctions on Venezuela? All the oil from Venezuela will be added to the global uh, oil energy. Can you imagine the sanctions on Iran if they want that? All the oil from Iran would be, you know. At least I am uh, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? content satisfied that at least iraq because iraq is a major oil producer is going to be uh, made about 18 billion dollars out of oil production so i hope they use that money to rebuild this country which we sort of destroy yeah. you know and if you know anything about iraq historically speaking iraq was the center of the arab civilization you know I learned one thing that in Iraq, it was where the grammatical rules of the Arabic language were established. Really? Yes, that's how uh, Iraq is something that most of us in the West uh, do not put much together. And and, mm -hmm. and and interesting enough of how the West, you know, because when you look at back when Saddam was alive, guess who was supporting Saddam? The United States, <laughs> Germany, Australia, UK, and France. And when they turned on the guy, it's just like, you know, that that's you know that that's a conversation for another day. So, but here is the bottom line: whatever part of the world you're in, you know, you're not gonna see a decreased oil prices quickly. It might take time, but at least between now and the end of the year, you know, I just don't see any anything happening. So there is the question becomes: is what will we expect in 2022 as far as energy production? So you might see an increase, but that increase is gonna be incremental, very yeah. very slow because OPEC wants to have more money oh shocking yeah so that's basically what it's question be. so we're gonna open this uh, uh the segment here for you guys for questions Ross will be reading questions and we'll answer to the best of oh order. Jack Robert has the U.S. stopped energy exploration at home to get foothold in energy markets outside the U.S. to stop non-allied nations getting influence in energy markets and making the dollar weaker wow Wow, that is a that is deep, man. Yeah, <laughs> good question, Jack. Yeah. Well, I do know, to my knowledge, I do know that uh, there's, as a matter of fact, a, a meeting, uh, not a meeting, a hearing in Congress from the uh, executives of the energy. You know, they're gonna be talking about climate change, but that's not what it's all about. I do know that the lobbyists for the energy industry here in the U.S. Uh, they're really influencing the political outcome uh, as to what decisions the United States can make or cannot make. So as as to that in relation to the weakening of a dollar, yes, there is some truth to that because remember all the, I'm sure you do know, Jack, that all the oil transactions, most of them are conducted in the, dollar. the US dollar. That was the whole setup with the Saudis as to, uh, in order for the United States to 
provide protection to the Saudis, <laughs> the transactions will be conducted in the US dollar. But this is where you are seeing now the, the change in the pipeline. By the way, guys, we're going to have uh, a very, very in uh, a guest next week uh, without, again, disclosing the name. Somebody who knows truly about the financial global market. And we intend to ask him this question uh, about the the the, uh, the value of the dollar. But when it comes down to the energy, uh, you get now some countries that uh, try, try, I mean transacting in other currencies besides the dollar. I, I think of China and Iran. I think of even China and Saudis. Yeah. You know, and Russia is moving into that direction. And, you know, they are they are some of them are going to be dropping the dollar altogether. So. Tandia Wan Chen, okay. Could the Arctic be the next battleground for exploration between China, Russia, and US, UK, EU? That's an interesting one. And it I have, been, I'll take the, if I can take this one here, Russ, because I wrote about it in my last book uh, about Russia. I, I devoted an entire half of a chapter about the Arctic into this. And I delved deeper into it, you know. Remember, in the Arctic, which uh, it's not disclosed openly, but the information is there if you know where to find it. There are about over $35 trillion worth of natural resources, including oil. So the idea of China investing with Russia into that, but also has to do with the melting ice, which means what? That's going to open up the path for more uh, transits for large ships and all that stuff. But the access to those energy uh, resources and the ground there, uh, that's going to really impact the global oil market. It depends, again, who gets there first. And this is why you're going to be seeing, you are already noticing now, NATO is conducting some exercises in the area. Uh, Russia, of course, has its uh, what called the Glover uh, base, which is very high tech. I had a chance to read up on what's in it inside. Not the classified info because I can't have access to that. Uh, but what I read up on that base is incredible what the Russians have put into that. Because they know the wealth in the Arctic, it's in natural resources. And oil is one of them. And it's phenomenal how much is there. It is a lot. I mean, we did a show on this. Yes, we did. It. And it and is a lot. We did a, a deep there. dive into yeah, massive is, amounts of resources. Yeah, it is a lot. And uh, I can see why China is investing on the pipelines coming down. Because that will be a supply to Europe as well. So everybody will benefit. So next question. Here is our buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Pronounce his name for me. Beryakov. Beryakov. Good okay. to see you, Beryakov. To both. Personally, do you believe in your lifetime to be able to see the USA transforms into a country as you wish now? Yes. Aware this is a really tough question. Uh, no, no, Beryakov, and I answer for me, uh, Russ can answer I'm going to answer the same thing. Yeah, for me, it's no. I don't see that happening. Because uh, once you understand how the political system operates in the United States, you know, and as one who worked in Washington for quite a while, way back, you know, I kind of get a glimpse, close proximity in understanding how the system works. Uh, there is basically what you see in the United States is, yes, the, the front is the White House, the front is the president front. But that's, you know, president has no power whatsoever. <laughs> president cannot do anything without being told. That's usually how you know, the way it operates in American system is behind the scenes. There is what I call the, the hidden hand that manages the trajectory of where things are going. But now with what's going on, what's been going on for the last two years, you're talking about a global entity here that is managing how things are going. So I don't foresee any change as far as how things are. Unless people get a little bit more informed and they know what that means. You know, if they want to change, they can make it happen. So, but other than that, for me personally, no, I don't see anything change. Not at all. Yeah. Vianam. Okay. Vianam. Good to see you, Vianam. Will Scotland get backing from the USA to break free from England? Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, it's about time. That's what I say. I'm not a Scottish. I have great respect for whomever, whatever part of the world. But at the same time, you know, this this long live the queen and all that nonsense stuff, you know, it has to stop. It has to stop. We live in a different time. So and maybe Scottish people. And again, only only Scottish people can decide on that. No one else has be, the right to get involved. I'd be surprised if the United States backed that. 
because England, Great Britain, has been such an ally for so long. But I think that the Scots people don't really need any help from anybody yeah, else. Why? There's already a major movement. I've, I track it because my history is there. Yeah. Uh, and they don't need any help. They're fed up. You're right. I mean, why should they, you know? And again, it will be up to them to decide. Absolutely up yeah. to them. None of our business. Yeah. I mean, it would be hard for us to say, well, this is what they need to do. No, no, they, they decide for it. But for me personally, the way I look at it is it's about time. It is about time. Senorel Tamakin. Yeah, I hope we okay. pronounce it correctly. Yeah. We're doing our best. They forgive us, Ross. Don't Question. worry. They forgive us. Okay. Can you do a report on China's new carbon chips development? How far ahead? When are they ready for production? That is a good question. I do not know personally about this one here. I intend to do uh, one episode with Elizabeth. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, guys, it's going to be coming soon. And, and we're going to do it as breaking news. Um, we just want to make sure of the information. And this pertains to the nuclear energy. That's going to be China because China is thinking about using by 2030. You know, For the carbon one, I do not know much. And I, I do know someone in mind that I can reach out to who happens to know a little bit about this field. And I can ask his opinions uh, to just see where things are because I don't claim to know and I do not know much about this. But that doesn't mean I can't find the answers. And yes, we will be happy to do this uh, as a show for Russ and I. But we're gonna, I'm going to do one with Elizabeth regarding uh, China's nuclear, uh, the energy part for uh, replacing because it's clean and all that. But yeah. it's risky, of yeah. course, but it's feasible. It's feasible and it will be a smart way to go about that because if china does that you know that's a big big change given its size of the economy markets oh, yeah. and all that and they don't have to worry about coal anymore but on the other hand they have to weigh the risks of all that and i am sure they will be very thorough with the well that's their reputation exactly and this is why and i i don't want to beat the dead horse here that that's why i got a little bit you know kind of for some comments about uh, the video we did about evergreen Evergrande was only one aspect of the big China segment. That is not what we... The reason why we asked the question we asked is to provide the idea of here is what the West is thinking. We just wanted to put that out there. That is not how necessarily we are thinking. The reason being because we are understanding that the real estate market, it's only one portion of a big pie in the Chinese economy. Right. And China is smart enough to know they're not gonna, the Chinese government, that is, they're not going to be putting all their eggs in one basket, you know. And uh, as a matter of fact, because you take, for example, the shortage in electricity, it's more a pressing issue than the real estate evergreen. And China government, it is my belief that they're going to, they ain't going to bail out evergreen because that's not what China government does, because that's not how they operate. If that needs to be let go, they're going to let it go. So that's the whole idea. Say Ong Kwan Win. I did my best. <laughs> did we all human need one legal system to control international media, which always sending wrong message okay. for someone to make third world suffer when their governments are weak? Okay. Yeah, let me take that. You want to yeah, do that? Go ahead. I, yeah. I, I think it, we're never going to see yeah, one the, world system. The short answer is no. And here is why, at least to my understanding of how global things operate. Because systems differ. You can have, you think about it, and this is a weird analogy. You look at your hand, okay? What do you see? You see five fingers, right? And each finger has a dip, different fingerprints. Think of the hand as humanity. And each finger is a country. Not all countries are the same. That's why you can't have one system that applies to everybody. And this is why you see, for example, and again, I'm going to give the example of China. Uh, why the, the West is criticizing so much China is this and that. Well, because we don't understand. That's the system that works for them. Right. Their system will not work for us here. Our system will not work for them over there. You know, uh, as far as the third world country, which we don't call them, by the way, third world country anymore. We call them uh, developing world. Uh, just FYI, because that's the language in the international relations. Uh, you know, you're going to have to think in terms of Africa, for example. 
you know, but why Africa? You know, I think of it this way. Just imagine this. Let's say you are somebody in marketing, okay? And you go to Africa. And you're going to look at Africans and say to yourself, oh, there is no market here. Okay? Then you bring someone else and goes to Africa and, and look at it and say, oh my gosh, there is a huge market here. Yeah. <laughs> see, I see what I'm getting at? It depends on your perspective, which means your perspective, the country that's looking at that. Africa has always been used by colonial powers because it's rich in natural resources. And of course, you don't want them to develop. So you can have always access to that. And this is why you're seeing now the resistance that's taking place in Africa with some countries getting involved, Russia, China, you know, Turkey, because they are expanding the infrastructure in those countries. The West is uh, so, sort of, uh, uh, they don't like that. Well, they're going to lose influence and control. Yeah, they resent the presence of them because they're going to lose that influence. And that's where I see, uh, just as far as the system won for the world, no, it won't work. Ariel. Our buddy. Ariel, I was wondering where he is at. Okay. Could China overcome coal dependency and its energy crisis with a short, short with a short term buildup of thorium molten salt? Oh, reactors. Is it possible in your opinion? Wow. You know, I've looked at these thorium molten salt reactors, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like they're they're in progress, but they haven't arrived yet. You know, the 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 heat in those things is hotter than the surface of the sun. But I think it's in the, it's in the future sometime. Wow. Well, that will be that will be that will be uh, another uh, source of energy for them away from coal. So they don't have to depend on anything. So would helium 3. You're absolutely correct. If that was yeah. if that was a national priority in the United States or China, who knows in China it I, might I, be. Yeah, I think China what China wants to do it for 2030 for the energy. That's why we're going to do that uh, uh, breaking news about it because I can see that happening in China faster than other countries. I do you too. Know, I do know. I do know this for a fact because uh, some of my members of my family live in France. I know France has some projects in the nuclear. That's where they derive their electricity from. They use uh, 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 nuclear energy for that. Yeah. That I do know. That's why you don't hear much about France and coal. They don't depend on that. Well, they have a record number of nuclear reactors. In exactly. France. I mean, they so, are. So China, China will be far better positioned than the United States to achieve this uh, uh, source of energy through either nuclear or what just Ariel would mention. So, yeah. So I do foresee that Ariel. I I do not know much. I am not uh, uh, into th this kind of field. Uh, but uh, if if the indications is that China is moving into that that track. Saf. How likely do you guys think the EU will will jointly buy natural gas in response to the surging prices? Uh, what choice have say, they got? How, how likely do you see, uh, think the EU will jointly will jointly buy uh, natural oh, gas? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that will be a challenge. That will be a challenge because, uh, for example, uh, and I heard something about this one here from Spain. Spain was uh, challenging the notion that. Well, Russia was telling the European Union is, sure, we'd be happy to provide you with this long-term contract. Mm -hmm. This is what Russia did with China that will provide natural gas for 30 years at about 200, $260 billion. Way back, that was so. So Europe, I don't see that happening. Why? Because there are issues inside Europe right now that there are tensions beneath. A lot of them. Yeah. And once you start hearing, for example, Will Poland get out of the EU? Right. You know, uh, Hungary get out of EU. You're gonna start to see a domino effect. You know, because basically, when we say Europe, the European Union, who do we say? Germany and and France. Yeah. And, uh, UK is out, of course, and and uh, so Spain, Italy, Portugal, all those. Their economy is not that strong enough. However, there is one aspect that I've been looking at regarding natural gas from the Mediterranean. Oh, and this yeah. is where, for example, Morocco can play a role because Morocco's proximity through Gibraltar, but but that would create tensions with the neighboring country of Algeria because there are tensions between the two countries. You know. Would you want to bring the pipes through Libya? You can't because of lack of stability. And Egypt is all the way out on the other side. So you can just see those dynamics that 
Uh, I just don't see Europeans doing it that way. Uh, the EU might agree to supply in winners from Russia if they come to an agreement, but a long term, I don't see that happening. Tamaputra? Tamaputra. Okay. Good to see you. France threatens to cut off Jersey Island electricity, and she, Macron, has was having some phone call before. Does this mean it, it does this mean that France is citing to China after being backstabbed by the by AUKUS? AUKUS, yeah. Yeah, it was a conversation between Xi and Macron regarding this because there is an indication that uh, one of the islands in that part of the world is asking yeah. for independence. They oh. might be going for independence from France. Because remember, France had a president. I had a chance one day to be in uh, Cambodia. I, I went to Phnom Penh. And so when I went around and walked around, you know, a lot of, lot, I found some French uh, uh, French restaurants owned by French people who've been living there. And, and one conversation after another, I find out that, you know, there is a, a large uh, uh, French presence in that part of the uh, in that part of the world, shall we say? So, uh, yeah, most likely will be the agreement between uh, China and France, given what just happened with the office. <laughs> because France, remember, for France uh, also their economy depends greatly on sale of weapons. That's one thing that uh, that's why France is very adamant about this AUKUS deal that they didn't. They didn't like it because yeah. that's a loss. You can't lose, you know, 40, 50 billion dollars. That was 50, uh, 45 uh, billion euros. That's quite a lot of money yeah. for their economy. So, so it makes more sense for France to get closer to China because, as we always say, you can't ignore the sheer size of the market of the Chinese on the global economy. So it will be to the benefit of France to really think through, you know, forget about the uh, U.S. or Australia or Germany or France, whatever. So, last all right, we'll do one last question, and, Danny, and, and we go from there. So, given the current Middle East tensions and China's increased presence in the region, how will these factors play into OPEC politics going forward, and how will it impact the November OPEC meeting? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I did a re I did a write uh, on two occasions, two separate books. One of them about Saudi Arabia, one of them about Iran, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China's presence in the Middle East. One thing that I my research found is that uh, the Chinese presence in the Middle East is not the same way as the United States. China's presence in the Middle East is on a soft power per se, but that is based not on a cultural stuff. It's based on economic incentives. That is what China is reaching stride or making strides and it comes down to its presence in the Middle East. And why countries like China in the Middle East? They like it because China is neutral. Yes. China doesn't get involved. You are this, you are that. China doesn't care about that kind of stuff, which is to me the best policy to approach. Middle East is complicated because of so many ethnicities. You know, The second thing to the China presence in the Middle East has to do with securing resources of uh, sources of energy. Because China consumes, by 2030, China will need about between 12 to 16 million barrels a day to manage its economy. Uh, and this is according to IEA, the International Energy Agency. And I looked at the stats and verified them. And they increased from 12 uh, million barrels to now 16 uh, in a matter of between 2012 to now 2030. So that is the reason why China is increasing that. And it became clear to me personally when China cut a deal with Iran yeah. regarding the military dimensions to it, in addition to the $400 billion that we talked about with uh, with Parsi. But on the other hand, they did also the uh, the deal with Saudi Arabia. So, And when you think about Saudi Arabia and Iran, what do you think of? The two main influencers in the Middle East. Right. Yeah. Let alone China already had deal with Turkey. Another emerging power in the Middle East. So, so China's presence in the Middle East is increasing, but again, not the same way that you and I think about how the United States does it, because China is not interested in that. China is interested in securing access to its energy. So, well, with that, uh, do you anything to add, Ross? I just want to thank people for their interesting questions. I mean, they really get us. They really keep us on our toes, and we're we're delighted that you took time to view us today. We'd like to invite you to subscribe if you have not subscribed. 
And yeah, well, of course, because there are so many other. Uh, uh, the, the reason why the questions are very important is because they are aware of what's going on. Yes, that's to me personally, it's a reflection of their intellectual capabilities. That's where they are. They are well informed. Right. So, uh, so we, we we thank you for that because it gives us a chance to learn from you as well. So, and uh, by the way, just before we take off, because we're gonna have to go prepare. Uh, our uh, presentation for our members. Remember to check the membership because, again, we can answer a few questions. We can answer a thousand, of course. But in the membership, we will be able to do this because it will be a small setting where we can really interact with you for whatever time we, you, you need, you know, because when we do those kind of uh, interaction, you know, it's um, time is open till you don't have any more questions. Also, we do the presentations. But the key to me personally is the idea that I can talk freely. And I do know a little bit of a few things. <laughs> I, I just can't talk on this platform here. I'm, I'm sure you guys understand all this. So uh, just to remind you guys, uh, first of all, we want to thank you for uh, appreciating our guests that just showed up last week. Uh, be on the lookout for next week. We're going to have some really, really interesting guests and some very interesting topics. And we are always open to your suggestion as far as guests you would like us to have or the topic you would like us to cover. So, so just keep that in mind. And we look forward to seeing you guys next Friday. So till then, always stay informed with that. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. See you guys.